Did it say that it's recording now? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. How beautiful to have so many people here. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Marina Citrin. I'm a professor of sociology at Binghamton University. And um, Dr. Mary Taylor and I, who's there at the CUNY Graduate Center, the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, will be co-moderating um, this event today. I don't know, Mary, if you want to say something. That's okay. I'll say a word about myself um, when I speak next. Thanks, Marina. Great. Okay. So I just wanted to let everyone know, as we've announced a few times now, um, there is interpretation into Kurdish and Spanish, and how to do that is in the link. Um, and since we have an incredible group of people dialoguing today from the universities in Rojava and scholars from all over the world, um, we plan to have this go for about an hour and a half. And so what that's going to mean is it's very unlikely we're going to have an open discussion, which is why all of you are on mute. There are other reasons people are on mute as well. Um, and so the way this event is going to go is that um, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Harvey are going to begin with about a five minute introduction overall to the event. And then we'll hear from um, and I will do a brief introduction for the scholars from the University of Rojava who are with us, who will be speaking, um, also giving a kind of general introduction and background both to the region and to the university system that's so innovative there now. Um, and then the way it will work is all of the international scholars who are joining us as formal guests and participants, I know all of you are scholars in different ways and from all over the world. Um, what we're going to do is have a question from each person, which will be maybe three or four minutes, and then a 15 minute response from the faculty at the University of Borjava, and then another question from another person. And Mary and I are going to go back and forth introducing the various scholars from around the world. Um, I will announce one more time, we are recording this event. We will share the recording widely, but if you're asking me individually to record, I am denying individual recordings of the event, and I apologize for that. Um, so without further ado, um, Mary, if you would begin and thank you, David Harvey for joining us. Okay. So greetings, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be part of this, uh, the organizing team. And I want to thank everyone who is here and has made an effort to take part in this very important discussion. Um, just a word about myself, Marina has already said, I'm at the CUNY Graduate Center at the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics. I think that's enough for me. Um, so what I'm going to do now is uh, to introduce David Harvey, who will say a few words, um, and then we will continue to move through our program. Um, so David Harvey, sitting next to me, my uh, good friend and mentor, is the Distinguished Professor of, of Geography and Anthropology here at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, um, among many, many, many books. Um, he is the author of The Limits to Capital and The Companions to Marx's Capital and Marx's Grundrisse. Um, you can, uh, if you are interested, you can access his many lectures on reading capital on his website, davidharvey.com. David and I were very um, fortunate to host uh, folks uh, from Rojava years ago before the university was founded. And that was one of the conversations we had back then was about the future of, of this university. So we're, we're both really thrilled to be here today. So I'm going to turn things over to David now. Yeah, I don't have uh, that much to contribute to the substance of uh, this meeting, but I'm absolutely delighted to be able to participate and, and listen in to what is happening. I was always very impressed from the very beginning with uh, the ideas that, and uh, some of the practices that were emerging in Rojava. And actually, I wanted to make one particular observation, which is, uh, I think, uh, very significant, and that is that we are at a time in the global situation where, put, to put it mildly, capital is in a mess. Capital is in a mess. Geopolitically, everything is in a mess. And it actually, therefore, seems to me that this long tradition of seeking alternatives and thinking about alternatives is no longer a matter of, uh, of choice. It's a matter of urgency. And that I think that uh, right now we have to discover 
uh, new ways to be able to look at uh, everything from the environmental question to uh, multicultural and multi-ethnic and other questions to really see ourselves uh, creating a new world, a new set of possibilities. And one of the things that was always a very inspiring about conversations uh, that I was having with people from Rojava uh, in the early, early days was precisely the ability to be able to think beyond, well, okay, this is just a solution to our problems. It's about getting a solution to the problems which exist uh, right now in terms of uh, the manner of economic development, the forms of economic development, and the way in which uh, capital itself is uh, doubling down on itself and in, in, in leading into a kind of almost a, a fictitious world where my own particular view right now is that uh, capital is really running on fumes. It's not running on, on real activity at all. And there's a lot of fictitious capital and fictitious forms around, uh, which are absolutely impossible to, to pin down and turn into something which is useful for the mass of the population. So we have a situation where I think the mass of the population would recognize that we, the, the, the need for something different. And that something different is the kind of thing that is beginning to be charged through the Rojava experience. And so I'm delighted to have the possibility to listen in, in terms of finding out what exactly is happening uh, to that movement right now. So with that, I will turn it over and turn it back uh, to to Mary and to you. And, and, and I look forward very much uh, to the discussion. Marina, I think it's over to you now. It is fabulous. Thank you. I can introduce you again if you'd like, but I think no, that, that is fine. Okay. That is fine. I'm at Binghamton University. I do want to say that our Department of Sociology and Rojava University have developed um, a formal relationship that we are very proud of. Um, so to, I'm going to introduce just briefly a number of participants. We have a number of faculty from the University of Rojava um, and the systems of edu formal education in Rojava with us who will all be speaking. Um, we have Dr. Mustafa um, Almholo. I'm sorry if I'm, you can help me with names, please. Um, who's a director of international relations in the office in Rojava University and the Civil Diplomacy Center of North and East Syria. We have Dr. Zozan, and she's with the Genealogy. We have uh, Dr. Rohan Mustafa, and she's the co-chair of the Center for Coordination between the Universities of North and East Syria. We have Dr. Sardar Sadi, who's the co-director of the Graduate Institute of Social Sciences and Humanities at the University of Rojava, which is graduating their first um, graduate class um, this year, which is a massive accomplishment to celebrate. And I think we might perhaps have some graduate students um, from the University of Rojava with us, which I should say, as we're facilitating, um, we had said that this is a dialogue between global scholars, you know, who were specifically invited in the University of Rojava, and if some of the graduate students or other faculty from Rojava um, choose to participate, that is something that that we have as, as an open possibility. And last, sorry, Dr. Sorgal Adsulaslam, who's also, she is the co-chair of the Faculty of Social Sciences. Um, so with that, I don't know if Sadar or Mohammed, which one of you is maybe facilitating amongst all of you for this presentation, how that's been organized. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marina. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, really grateful for all of your work, all of, uh, uh, the team behind, uh, this session. It's, uh, it's really amazing to see so many uh, familiar and new faces. I was very lucky and honored to uh, meet Professor David Harvey in Diyarbakir in 2015. And I actually interviewed him uh, at that time. Uh, he was trying to go to Kobani, but uh, it uh, it was uh, a little bit difficult. I'm not sure uh, if uh, you could uh, go, Professor Harvey, uh, but uh, yes, yeah. Uh, we, at, 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 as the people working with the universities of Northeast Syria, uh, we know that uh, the work that we are doing there is uh, of course under uh, like immense uh, pressure with all sort of attacks, all sort of uh, embargoes against uh, the region and with everything that's happening in the region. And uh, we know that uh, 
this sort of events, this sort of relationships, the solidarity that uh, uh, we are building with uh, scholars, with academics, with activists, with uh, people around the world is the way for our uh, survival, is the way for uh, our flourishing and continuing uh, um, to collaborate, to uh, cooperate with uh, uh, people uh, around the world who want a different, a better uh, future, a better, uh, a better possibilities for uh, people who are suffering, especially in in the in the region where uh, we are. I think uh, we can start with Mamusta Rohan. Uh, she will uh, Mamusta Rohan Mustafa. Uh, she has been doing uh, academic work with the universities of the region uh, since uh, two thousand fourteen. In 2015, she was uh, uh, one of the leading uh, uh, academics at the University of Afrin. Afrin, uh, in 2017, was occupied by Turkey and still it's under occupation. Unfortunately, University of Afrin was turned into uh, a branch of the University of Gaziantep. And this is where the politics of assimilation of Turkey uh, has extended beyond the borders of uh, the country. The Mamusta Rohan, uh, Mustafa. So Mamusta basically is a Kurdish name. Uh, when we call a teacher, uh, uh, it's a kind of uh, a substitute for doctor or professor. Uh, Mamusta Rohan, Mustafa uh, has been leading a coordination center for the universities of Northeast Syria uh, since the, its establishment. And uh, she is one of the faculty uh, of the University of Rojava. So without further ado, I will leave uh, uh, the screen to Mamusta Rohan and uh, I can maybe after that provide uh, a little bit of background into the education system in the Northeast uh, Syria region, how it started like and the, uh, uh, the kind of contextualize it with the, uh, uh, with the history of uh, uh, Syria and education in Syria uh, in the past uh, 50 years. Mamusta Rohan Keremka. And for those, uh, Mam Sarhan is going to speak in Kurdish. You can select uh, uh, English uh, uh, to uh, hear her out. Thank you, Mam Sarhan. Dr. Sardar, the Dambash, good evening. The speaker, I'm Khiratna Hamuka Sinki Uru, Mara V. Dialoka, the Nerg, the Bukimet. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone uh, in this panel today. I'm very excited to be here, to be with you. And the colorfulness of this seminar, all of you that participate and devote your time to be here today. Uh, it's it strengthened our uh, experience, uh, our work that we are doing for our university. And uh, we value their work, those who spare their time and contribute this process. We all know when the war uh, started in, in Syria, and especially in Rojava, at the beginning of the uh, Rojava revolution. The atrocities that uh, applied to Rojava uh, from Turkey and their gangs mainly, uh, especially with army means. On the other side, uh, we had to defend ourselves and at the same time uh, establish our, this institution, our revolutionary work. Uh, at the same time, we had to dealt, uh, deal with uh, war and real life. Real life as in, um, in academia too. Uh, 
as Dr. Sardar uh, has mentioned, uh, African University was established in 2015. Uh, Kobani was established, uh, uh, University of Kobani was established in 2017. And uh, Raqqa, the university in Raqqa was established in 2021. Time by time, uh, we've um, had this intention in, and, and worked towards it. Uh, the universities were not only to be for Kurds, but also for the all the peoples that lived in the region, for Arabs, for non-Kurdish non uh, groups of uh, people uh, and it was to be for all peoples of the region in midst of these difficulties we aimed to uh, create alternative uh, universities uh, universities that have philosophy of uh, free uh, people uh, and uh, with our, in line with our philosophy of the Kurdish movement, uh, the equality between uh, men and women, uh, wom woman freedom, ecologic life, uh, and uh, we've established our uh, universities based on these uh, philosophies. Um, uh, our aim is to create alternative uh, uh, universities compared with the uh, existing universities. Uh, the, because the, all the universities before us were established in the region uh, from the perspective of states, the states in the region, uh, who had the nation states uh, mindset, one language, one religion, one angle of uh, knowledge. Uh, therefore, our universities are alternative ones. And when I said alternative, it's with alternative uh, works against the mono cultural universities. The, the universities that are in Middle East are in the shade of, under shade of the capitalism. And uh, they serve as a tool to the state, to the regimes in the region. Despite the fact that the, the improvements in 21st century uh, technological and um, knowledge, and, uh, unfortunately in the region, uh, the, the war is in rise, the problems are in rise uh, against the will of a university, against the will of knowledge. Uh, therefore, we say, uh, in our opinion, the the, the, the knowledge, the uh, philosophy should be uh, in serve of people, uh, not to create problems, to solve the problems, to have a life without um, fear. Uh, because their universities wanted to uh, have an education to have more people like themselves, like my, their mindset, mindset. As opposed to them, our philosophy is to uh, educate people with a uh, free mind uh, who serve uh, for freedom. Many many might say that this is just a philosophical um, um, 
thing that is difficult to bring in in life but with our system in, uh, throughout our, our universities we are uh, bringing life these ideas uh, not just theoretically but also practically in everyday life for example we said uh, for us the equality between men and uh, women is a pioneer thing and therefore uh, the universities of uh, northeast syria uh, have established accordingly uh, and we have co uh, chair system uh, along our universities you can see appearance of men and women equal there is not hierarchy there is not um, upper or, or below uh, we are all uh, equal and uh, valuable with the work that we do not with who we are and strengthen the uh, with this we've established the um, uh, uh, free associations through these associations through this uh, uh, we have platforms everyone can uh, express their their ideas uh, again equally Uh, when when you you see uh, uh, the index of our material that we uh, teach throughout the classes, uh, again the the means of uh, free society is the valued one, is a strengthened one, in line with the philosophy that we are working uh, as a base. Uh, with the dem democratic nation uh, with index of uh, uh, such ideas that we want to bring forward in everyday life uh, we work and we live with these philosophies it's not just a theoretical thing, uh, thing that is uh, at university, but it's also at everyday life. But unfortunately, uh, as we try to do these works, the, the atrocities, the attacks uh, by others are still uh, heavily ongoing, uh, mainly from Turkey. This doesn't matter how much we agree or not these um, attacks are still there uh, as an everyday practice and and their aim is to uh, to stop to make it difficult for, for us to 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 uh, work in line our uh, philosophies Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the situation can go bad. Um, they, uh, as a result of those attacks, we lose our uh, members of our society, our uh, friends, comrades. Uh, as we uh, try to strengthen our, the base of our universities, uh, at the same time, they work and uh, with aim of making it difficult for us. Uh, and uh, as an example of Aprin, uh, the they try to um, assimilate the, the peoples of this area. As the example of Aprin in Serikania, in Grispi 
and Afrin, uh, not only Kurds, but also Arabs of the region are being victim of this assimilation policy, as in uh, society engineering. Uh, and as as we uh, the conditions that we are living in uh, we need to uh, still work hard and and uh, work towards our goal of uh, uh, creating our free society and background of the uh, education system in northeast uh, Syria, especially higher education. And uh, um, I'm hoping we will have uh, more time uh, for discussions. Uh, I think I can share my screen, right? Yes. OK, so basically, uh, uh, I hope uh, the translation uh, was uh, uh, okay, and, uh, and because Mam Sarwahan basically provided uh, an overview of uh, the education system of uh, the region and uh, the background and how uh, right now the uh, autonomous administration of Northeast Syria uh, is strategizing on uh, pedagogy and uh, uh, higher education. But uh, if I uh, provide a little bit more background in, uh, into uh, what's going on basically in uh, Northeast Syria, uh, the region that we call uh, Rojava, especially in the early uh, years of the revolution. Uh, so the region uh, that you can see in the map uh, right now, and I have uh, other maps that I can show maybe, Northeast Syria or Rojava uh, is basically uh, it's one of the areas of Syria where the majority of Kurdish population and other ethnic and religious communities such as Arabs, Assyrians, Armenians, Syriacs, Chechens, and Yazidis, Turkmens, and others live. And the diversity of this region was shattered by the colonial mappings in the early uh, 20th century. It was followed by the rise of uh, the newly established uh, nation states and decades of nationalist ideologies and nation building projects in Syria, in Turkey, in Iraq. Uh, it, it was, uh, of course, uh, after Sykes-Picot uh, agreement, uh, followed by Lausanne agreement uh, that uh, partitioned Middle East between uh, all of those countries that we have right now. Many of these communities, especially Kurds, have historically been subjected to uh, these politics in different forms of violence, marginalization, and exclusion. Their rights for a peaceful life on their lands have been violated. They have been displaced, dispossessed. The right for a free and democratic education in their own language have been denied. The language and cultural practices have been suppressed. They have been assimilated and their life has been shaped in constant struggle for basic rights. Uh, and especially in Syria, politics of assimilation and Arabization not only changed the demography of the region, especially in the 1960s uh, with the Arab Belt project, if you uh, are familiar, but also displaced and dispossessed hundreds of thousands of uh, Kurds, stripped citizenship from many of them and banned Kurdish language and culture. The education system of uh, Syria followed, and in many parts still follows, this politics. In this system, as in other uh, authoritarian education systems, knowledge is the property of the state, and schools are the means of installing the state's chauvinist uh, ideology in the society and creating desired citizenship and nationhood. And uh, moreover, uh, there was a strategy of de-development against the region. And uh, this, uh, uh, this strategy deprived the region from schools and educational infrastructures and uh, kept people intentionally illiterate. And that was uh, another side of uh, the state violence in the region. 
so if I go back to the uh, the other map, uh, the only university in the region was uh, before the revolution, the Rojava revolution 2012 was Al Furat, uh, and it was established in 2006 in Deir Zor. Uh, Al Furat University had a branch in Hasake, uh, and uh, um, uh, there was uh, an, another intent, uh, another uh, not campus, but uh, kind of a school in uh, in Raqqa. But uh, that was it. That was the only uh, higher education institute in uh, in the east of uh, Euphrates River. After the revolution, as uh, Rohan Mustafa said, uh, uh, the University of Afrin uh, was established in 2015. But uh, uh, with the Turkish invasion of 2018, it was uh, 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 taken over and became uh, a branch of the University of Gaziantep, as I said. Then the University of Rojava 2016 established uh, with uh, four campuses, one in Kamishlu, one in Romelan, and another one in uh, Hasake. The one in Serekani was also, uh, uh, let me go back to the previous one. The one in uh, Serekani was uh, again occupied uh, after the Turkish invasion of the region in 2019. Uh, in 2020, uh, 2017, uh, the University of Kobani was established and it was uh, a really symbolic uh, uh, university because Kobani was uh, basically uh, uh, demolished entirely because of the, uh, uh, the resistance and the war against ISIS uh, in 2014-2015. So the opening of uh, uh, the university in that city was uh, quite symbolic, uh, similar to uh, University of Al Sharq in Raqqa. As you know, uh, Raqqa was the capital of uh, the Islamic State, and uh, in 2021, when uh, the University of Al Sharq was established, it was uh, uh, like in in a genuine uh, uh, meaning of uh, uh, community work. It was something that was uh, produced, that was established, that was uh, made by the people of uh, Raqqa, by the intellectuals, by academics who refused to leave Syria. They remained there. And uh, most of the faculty uh, members, most of the staff uh, of the University of al Sharqa are uh, natives of uh, Raqqa. And uh, it's interesting that uh, the Syrian regime is most sensitive with the University of al Sharq because they said, you can go back to your Kurdish cities, do whatever you want uh, for the time being, but you cannot do anything for, uh, uh, for in Arabic for the people, uh, the, the Arab people of the region. And uh, the, this shows, basically, this university shows that this project is not a nationalist project for the Kurdish population of the region. This is a project for the whole of the country. This is a, a uh, a revolutionary project for democratic transformation for the region, an alternative uh, for uh, not just Syria, but the whole region. This uh, alternative is coming based on the paradigm of democratic confederalism uh, written and uh, produced by uh, um, the imprisoned leader of uh, uh, the Kurdish leader, Abdullah Ojalan. Uh, you may uh, be familiar with uh, Abdullah Ojalan's works and uh, uh, probably our friends are uh, going to talk about that uh, in more details. So uh, maybe a few more words about why these universities are important. Uh, as Mamsta Rohan said, uh, these universities are kind of turning around the politics of higher education in the region. But uh, when you see at the, the programs of these universities, uh, you, you, you feel the need for raising a new generation of professionals to rebuild the society and uh, infrastructures in the region. Elementary and secondary teacher programs in science and humanities are tr the primary ones in these universities, besides uh, some engineering programs in agriculture, petroleum, electricity, mechatronic, as well as civil engineering. Uh, so uh, the need for rebuilding this region is one of uh, the vital ones for the people of the region. Uh, as uh, Rohan said, uh, there is like there's like this two parts of this dialectic of uh, living in the region. One side is uh, to fight 
to to protect the region, to protect the, its achievements, to protect the revolution. The other side is to build, to rebuild uh, an institutions, infrastructures, uh, uh, despite all of the attacks, the invasions of the Turkish army and uh, all other uh, hostile uh, groups and countries of, in the region, the embargo that has been imposed on Rojava. Uh, just in two weeks ago, Turkey uh, destroyed the, the very basic and infant infrastructures of the region, like all of the power stations, uh, the electricity grid uh, system in the region, the water uh, treatment uh, facilities, schools, uh, uh, many, many roads and uh, many uh, places where uh, people could get fuel, all of them were destroyed. Like uh, I heard that uh, the damage is more than $2 billion. And uh, the, the money probably is not uh, that important as the material because there is no material to rebuild these areas. There is no uh, uh, expertise in the region that can rebuild this electric grids, the, the water facility, the treatment facilities, and all of the infrastructures that are needed for, uh, for the people to uh, live a decent life. And uh, on the side of the social uh, sciences and humanities, uh, uh, Roham Mustafa said like some of these, the pillars of these programs, but they would also add that decolonization and reclaiming knowledge is an incredible, uh, incredibly important aspects of these programs and uh, emphasizing on multilingual and multicultural characteristics of the region and implementing programs that uh, that aims to uh, relieve education in, in this language is uh, very important. It is while uh, these universities are incorporating ancient philosophy and teachings of the indigenous peoples of uh, Mesopotamia, uh, there is also a firm refusal against the state's education, uh, educational system and pedagogy. And there are like many, many examples on how uh, these universities are uh, refusing the state's uh, uh, education policy. And one very important part of that that I'm hoping that will have been our discussions, the conversation today, uh, centralizing women and knowledge and the knowledge system known as genealogy, which can translate into the science or the, the knowledge system of women in the education system of the region. And this is the kind of a ideological groundwork that has been uh, developed by the Kurdish women's movements based on the teachings of, uh, uh, again, the imprisoned Kurdish leader Abdullah Öcalan. And the slogan, uh, Jinjian Azadi or Women Life Freedom that uh, took over Iran and uh, hopefully will take over the whole uh, region. It became a global slogan. It's coming from this moment. Uh, in fact, Ojalan is the architect of the, the theoretical framework behind all of that. And, uh, and each university has departments of genealogy. And genealogy is an integrated uh, uh, part of all of programs in the university. It doesn't matter science or uh, humanities. Uh, so just to uh, conclude, these universities and their ideals, of course, are very ambitious. They come with major uh, challenges and obstacles. As Roham Safa said, building an alternative university has been very difficult and an impossible task uh, for, for um, for many people around the world, for many communities around the world, but especially in Rojava, because they have to deal with the history of assimilation, with the history of uh, uh, all of the fights between communities and all of the, the issues, sectarianism, and uh, uh, the state imposed the uh, ideology and the educational system. So against all of that, and also to rebuild this region, uh, it has been a very big, uh, uh, challenge, the lack of professional and academic stuff is another uh, side of that. And uh, teaching in Kurdish and non-Arabic languages is also a very difficult task because of decades of assimilation and repression against these languages. And uh, we don't have the capacity to uh, uh, tr translations and of translations, Kurdish translations in our, for our uh, classes. And the lack of material in these languages and in, in general is a very, very crucial one. Uh, but uh, on top of all of that, the lack of recognition for the region and for all of these universities is one uh, 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 really uh, 
uh, terrible side of the, all of that because of all of our work. Uh, of course, we don't uh, ask for recognition. We uh, we don't care about recognition. We do our work with our communities, but uh, um, like rightfully, some of students they are worried about if uh, their diploma is valid because the regime does not uh, approve this education system, and the region, the autonomous administration of Northeast Syria, is not uh, a recognized uh, internationally recognized. Uh, uh, entity. Uh, so the work that we are doing is basically uh, uh, a work for the community, for the people, and to prove that, uh, as Professor David Harvey once told me, in the most difficult places, alternatives can be born. Thank you. Thank you, Sardar and Rohan Mustafa, for your really um, enlightened and um, heartfelt comments and information shared with us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce our, our next speaker, who's here in solidarity um, from South Africa. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Di Pulo Paiku. Um, she is an activist scholar and decolonial feminist. Uh, she's an international movement builder working with the intersection of grassroots movement building and academic scholarship. She's lived and worked across 45 countries and is a member of the Walter and Patricia Rodney Commission on Reparations, leading the South African chapter on the political economy of reparations there. Her work contributes to reassessing well-being economics from a feminist well-being perspective, and she has been working on including international trade and international economics in the context of North-South relations, political economy, regional integration of African states, feminist economics, international development, and international re relations in relation to African positionality over 20 years. Is a senior research fellow at Trade Collective and a fellow at the University of Johannesburg. She's a member of Wellbeing Economy Alliance, a member of Africa Futures Lab and the South Feminist Futures. And of course, she's also currently part of the Global Tapestry of Alternatives where we met her. So um, with, all, with no further ado, I'd like to invite you, Di Pulo, to join us now. I'm Thanks so much, Sorry Mary. For I really... But we have a translation problem right now. I can hear Kurdish translation in the English channel. So the translator who is translating into Kurdish should change the channels. I think that was probably coming through me because I couldn't, uh, I'm not coordinated enough to speak to you and change the interpretation at the same time. So let's see. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. I hope I'm audible without any multiple languages and and so I'd, I'd first say thank you so much my name is, has been said is Diepolo Peku um, I am indeed based in South Africa a child of many nations but mostly today I'm really standing here in solidarity with the comrades the colleagues the friends from this extremely complicated region and identity of Rojava and I'd really like to perhaps situate my comments there as well um comments slash questions slash statements of solidarity and I think the first is really that I'm really interested in what um many of us I mean I think especially in South Africa and many other settler states territory is everything and there and and coming from a uh, being a re recovering from settler colonial state, I am really intrigued and fascinated by the way that identities can be formed that are transgeographic and translocational. I mean, across all different countries, um, and I'm also interested in how then this means that in a non-linear and a non-territorial state how is belonging defined and what does citizenship mean in that regard? Um, especially a nation that is without borders um, and, and a nation that is without walls as it were. Um, and, and I'm also very intrigued because I think that this is a challenge of how we construct meaning um, in nations, um, in states and in statehood and even in personhood. 
What does it mean to belong if we don't have a territory which we call our own? And again, the basis of settler colonialism is this notion that states and land are everything. So um, I, I would love to hear and understand a bit more from the comrades how this is playing itself out. Uh, I think the other piece is this curriculum of revolution and this um, revolutionary curriculum that has centered feminist principles and feminist um, imaginations as the thing that everything else must be wrapped around, the thing that governance must be wrapped around, um, the thing that belonging, the thing that um, the, the thing that the functioning of this and, and the, the design of this state and of this of this being is wrapped around. And I, I would be interested to know a bit more around how this was even, you know, patriarchy is a big, big, big animal. And I'd be interested to understand how. Um, this is being mediated, this is being transacted, this is being pushed back. Um, what are the negotiating places of negotiation? Um, and perhaps the places of tension in this um in this in this in this in this very deeply defined and ingrained and embedded feminist revolutionary principle. Um and, and also this whole notion of what it means to be non-statist. I mean, this vernacular of non-statism, which is, of course, very patriarchal and very masculine. You know, I've, I've written a paper in the past called Men and Their States because it is very much around our our countries and the big man who runs our states. And I've always been of the suspicion that women are basically adjacent to this project, you know, before the, the national project. And how then Rojava and, and the Kurdish imagination gives us the opportunity to rethink and to reframe this in ways that are really thoughtful, intentional, revolutionary, non-adjacent and, and centered, you know, centered in a, in a space and a place that gives meaning to belonging beyond states, beyond men and their states in ways that I think the rest of the world has a lot to draw from. And I really look forward to drawing from that. So, and I thank you and I send deepest, deepest love and respect as well. Thank you. I think, I don't think you have to raise your hands. I think if you can decide amongst, I mean, of the struggle, if you want to decide amongst yourselves who responds, that would be wonderful. Sure. Uh, if so people could speak slowly, I'm sorry, I should have said this earlier. There's been a request from the translators. Thank you. Okay. So, Gul and Zozan, if you would like to uh, respond, uh, that would be great. And speak slowly, please. سورگول یان زوزان اگر که شکرم آخون برسف بدن هیدی هیدی با آخفن جبر که پرسکلی که ورگره هیا سورگول بله بسیار الوز آماده همه بسیاری از که خوش مثل بیده دیالوگی بومه بخیر حتنا همی کسیم بسیار وقت I'm greeting everybody uh, thank everybody to have come to this talk. Uh, the questions were spanning across many topics, so I will try to give a response about the system that is uh, being created in Rojava. Uh, it's one that is uh, going beyond the classical nation state. Uh, is being pioneered in Kurdistan, a Kurdistan that has that fell victim to how the partition between different states. It's a people, the Kurds are a people and also the other peoples in the region that have existed for thousands of years in the same in the same region. The revolution that started in Rosh Aba in 2011 uh, wanted to create an alternative system. Uh, 
Internet has gone oh. outside. Uh, your voice isn't coming very well uh, across. Maybe you can turn off your camera. The revolution uh, that ha uh, started in Syria in 2011, the base for the big changes that we wanted to push forward have been implemented in Rojava in northern east Syria. The system, uh, the system adheres to the principles of democratic independence, which uh, does not try to enforce a rule, a centralized rule on the region. It was created to solve the it was also created to solve the issue of the partition of Kurdistan. Abdullah Öcalan suggested, uh, in theory, a solution where borders could be lifted in a region where so many peoples are living. Since the state of the Ba'as regime in Syria started its assimilation policies on all the different ethnicities in the region. The different communities were forced into, into identifying with into losing their identity. So there are many peoples in the region that have their old traditional religions that actually want to survive and they have identified themselves with the uh, option to be able to express themselves in a democratic independent region. They understood as well that it's a very alternative system that uh, has never seen, be, never been seen before. That gives you the option to govern yourself. All the while, we see how the surrounding states are trying to obstruct the creation of this totally alternative system. But they could uh, easily, in theory, change their own uh, system uh, to that of a non-centralized, non-enforcing uh, democratic autonomous system. Um, that was all that I wanted to say. Ruskar? Uh, Professor Zozan, maybe she wants to say something about genealogy. Good afternoon. I'm very happy uh, to be able to join this 
project. We are very happy that we can talk about the system of Rosh Ava and that there is much attention for it, and also for the work about genealogy. We are very happy about that. These are these are steps that we, of course, they are totally applicable to the whole world, but we uh, see that it is a reflection of the solution that we are trying to find for Kurdistan and the regional problems, that this reflection is uh, mirroring to the world as a solution. Um, as we are doing here, it can be applied to the world. Uh, someone who is not able to find a solution for their own region is not able to find a solution for the women uh, around the world. That's the situation as we see. The work of genealogy is um, understood by that principle practically. We have very difficult circumstances. So how should we define how is a person, especially a woman, able to decide on her own fate, uh, despite all the attacks from occupiers and uh, social norms. So how are you able to protect yourself? There are many situations of uh, poverty. How are you able to overcome that? How are you able to educate in your own language, which has been prohibited for such a long time, uh, over the decades? The things that have accumulated in genealogy is uh, basically the answer answer to to all those questions the 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 pre leader up uh, after ojalan has coined uh, the principle of uh, genealogy and also the word but all our activists have uh, worked it uh, further brought it to different levels and discussed it uh, in every aspect so all the borders that uh, would have been national or regional, they have been already uh, or exceeded. So the communication that we are doing are the base for, for this process, and we are all learning from each other, uh, both in the region and also from all around the world of different feminist uh, organizations that have experiences that are necessary for us to know, and also the experiences that the Kurdish women have uh, accumulated during the revolutions uh, as uh, part of the philosophy as knowledge and also about the capitalist influence which degraded society's uh, situation. The experience of the Kurdish woman is very big and we can also from our side give uh, knowledge to, to the world. And women are uh, living under a situation of oppression everywhere, uh, especially under the capitalist system. So we all are able to benefit from each other. Uh, there's a dialogue going on from both sides, uh, a very rich one where all experiences are shared. We are able by that way to uh, to bring for, uh, forward our activism for, uh, for genealogy. We see the result of uh, all this interaction between different groups, and I'm not sure if that was the only question, but I can answer spe to specific questions if they are repeated. Thank you so much. So I think um, Mary and I have decided, um, we appreciate I mean, the questions, the conversation so far, and our translators, without whom we couldn't talk to each other, how important you are, and, um, we committed to not letting this go on very, very long for the sake of our translators as well. Um, so what we decided to do is we will cluster the next three questions. And so um, I will introduce Arturo, Mary will introduce Teresa, I will then introduce Walden, and you'll each ask your question. And then the answers can be taken collectively. And we can go a little past 1.30, we started a little late, um, but the translator should signal us when it starts to just feel too much. Um, okay, so Arturo Escobar 
is an activist researcher from Cali, Colombia, working on territorial struggle, struggles against extractivism, eco-social transitions, and ontological design. He was professor of anthropology and political ecology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill until 2018, and is currently affiliated with the PhD program in environmental sciences at the Universidad del Valle in Cali, that's in Colombia. Over the past 30 years, he's worked closely with Afro-descendant environmental and feminist organizations in Colombia. His most well-known book is Encountering Development, The Making and Unmaking of the Third World. His most recent books are Designs for the Pluri Universe, Radical Independence, Autonomy and the Making of Worlds, and Pluriuniversal Politics, The Real and the Possible. Thank you, Arturo. So if you would put your question in the mix and then we're gonna hold it. Thank you. Arturo, you're muted. Arturo is unmuted, but there is no sound coming in. So perhaps it's the head. Are you speaking in? Ah, did everyone go back to the original language, Arturo? He had this problem earlier and fixed it, so I know that he can do it again. Arturo, do you want to work on fixing it? And we have Teresa, maybe Mary, do you want to introduce Teresa? Is that okay? And Arturo, you work on... You sure, can, let's do that. You, can hear Arturo, your voice you, you fixed it before, so I'm sure that you'll you'll figure out how to do it. So in the meantime, I'd like to introduce Teresa O'Keefe. She's a senior lecturer at the Department of Sociology and Criminology at the University College Cork in Ireland. She's a feminist sociologist who has been active in a number of campaigns in Ireland, including international feminist solidarity groups. Her research examines women's roles in revolutionary movements and feminist movement building in deeply divided societies. Her book, Feminist Identity Development and Activism in Revolutionary Movements, offers the first significant history of women's involvement in the Irish Republican movement during the Northern Irish Troubles. Arturo, shall we try you for your question now? And um, we can always uh, go back to Teresa's question. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, I have to take my headsets off. Just a second. Well, just let me know when, hopefully it's going to be three minutes only. And I had two questions. I'm going to ask only one, but I want to, because we won't have time to do more. The, first, the second question was going to be about the concept of democratic modernity. Uh, but that will be a more theoretical political question and we'll leave that aside. I'm very interested in that because for a Latin American critical uh, activist intellectual, it's a very counterintuitive notion that we can actually talk about the democratic modernity, but I know the context there is very different. different. So my question, which I really worked on with uh, close friend Sochi Leiva Solano, from Chiapas, Mexico, who is very close to the Zapatist struggle, is about the impact of the current conjuncture for the conditions under which the radical struggles of today are taking place. And I think uh, Rohan already referred to it when she said that the conditions on the ground are so difficult now that it makes it almost impossible to carry on the implementation of the philosophy, the non-hierarchical philosophy, anti-capitalist philosophy of the Rojava revolution in the practice in everyday life. So let me make just, just a quick observation and I will ask the question. My observation is the, is the following, that with climate change and the war in Ukraine, and the brutal uh, massacre that Israeli forces are committing in Gaza now after the Hamas violent actions in, in Israeli territory are to me um, a very clear evidence that the power elites of the world, especially the Western world, are totally unable to choose life over death. So in that sense, 
what we are getting stuck with is a new power structure, which is hyper concentrated at the top, even more than it has been now, uh, which has an amazing power destruction. It has a license to kill, and they are using it. They are using it in Chiapas today. They are using it in, uh, in so many territories in the world today. So how does they create new conditions for the struggle, for thinking about the struggles uh, in the context in which uh, is the is not only the crisis of liberal humanism, but it's the death of liberal humanism. Uh, and as a humanism based on values, that nobody believes in that, those values anymore. We cannot believe in those values anymore. So my question is, how are these changing the conditions for these radical alternatives and alternative struggles of today, which as David said in his remarks, is an urgent need for the planet for, for the planet at large, not only for the global south, but for everybody in the world. How do we rearticulate the commitment to the territorial struggles in the global south, including these iconic struggles of Rojava and Sabotismo, Sheran, and so forth? Uh, what, what do we do now in those conditions, especially when people are so um, um, so beaten them up and, and so under attack in the territories that they are finding it very difficult to even go along with any re revolutionary political project. So that's my question. Thank you, Arturo. Um, and Teresa, apologies. I've introduced you and then asked you to wait. So uh, just a quick reintroduction. Uh, Teresa is senior lecturer at um, University College Cork in, in Ireland, and her, her work uh, is kind of summarized in her book, Feminist Identity Development and Activism in Revolutionary Movements. Teresa. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today to be able to stand in solidarity with my comrades and, and colleagues at the University of Rojava. Um, the comments that I'm going to make and the question that I'm going to, to pose to you come from, I suppose, a combination of my own practice as a feminist activist, um, but also as an academic who's concerned with feminist epistemology and um, I suppose the knowledge making or knowledge production around of women's experiences. Um, and this is a starting point in, in 2015, um, a delegation from the Free Women's Congress uh, came to Ireland. Um, they visited Ireland to meet with campaigners and activists. And as part of that tour, I organized an informal meeting with um, women who were involved in various feminist campaigns, whether it be reproductive justice, environmental, housing campaigns, uh, international solidarity. And Amongst the many topics of conversation that we discussed that day were um, how do we build movements um, across borders? How do we build solidarity across borders, feminist solidarity in particular? But also how do we ensure that women's voices are heard, documented and made visible within movements? So this has been an issue that's been well documented um, uh, throughout history. And on the basis of that fruitful uh, meeting in Dublin, I was invited to write uh, for the third edition of Genealogy, uh, an article um, based on my own research on gender equality and the revolutionary struggle uh, within Ireland, more commonly referred to as Irish Republicanism. I was asked to write around the theme of women and, and revolution. And the question, the framing that was put to me in that invitation was, and I'm gonna read it out, a, a, a quote, if, if I may, um, from that request. Um, and this is from the editors of Genealogy at the time. In order for women to be free, we need to analyze the historical processes of how the patriarchal, and capitalist system affect us and to uncover and document these effects. We need to analyze the experiences of women's struggles and we need to push them forward. We know that many 
uh, from many revolutionary experiences and processes that are claimed by class or national identity, the question of women has been undermined or postponed. Although women played the role as a, a revolutionary force, they retreated back into the kitchen at the end of the day, and the roles they played are undermined, silenced, or hidden. And I'd like to use that, that, that framing that was put to me and, and put it back to you and use it as a springboard to ask, um, to ask our colleagues to reflect on the tensions that arise, I suppose, in creating authentic histories of women's experiences in revolutionary movements. My own research on, on the North of Ireland shows that there's a tension not only from within movements and fear around being honest and talking about you know, these difficult questions, which um, you know, discuss kind of the, the perhaps the sidelining or the invisibilizing of women's experiences. Another barrier to that comes from the problematic gaze of Western feminists or feminists from the, the, the global north who tend to be dismissive of women's roles in a revolutionary struggle. So with these kind of tensions in mind, I, I'd love for you to reflect a bit more on some of the practices that you've used um, or that are used through genealogy and through the, the establishment of the University of Rojava um, that allow us to develop, I suppose, histories or the, of our, our women's involvement in movements um, that are meaningful, but also that encourage uh, international solidaristic relationships amongst women as well. Wow, so, those yeah. are both fabulous questions. And um, we're holding a lot. And I'm gonna introduce Walden Bello, who's also going to share a question. And this just points to how much we need these um, collaborations and these conversations. I could see a series of mini conferences coming out of this, maybe in Rojava, some of them in person or in all of our different locations around the world. Um, so Walden Bello is concurrently the in, in International Professor of Sociology with us here at the State University of New York in Binghamton, a senior visiting research fellow at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at Kyoto University, and co-chairperson of the Bangkok-based Research and Advocacy Institute Focus on the Global South. He's the author or, or co-author of 25 books, including uh, more, most recently Counter-Revolution, The Global Rise of the Far Right, Paper Dragons, China and the Next Crash, Food Wars, Capitalism's Last Stand. Unfortunately, it has a question mark on it. So um, Dragons in Distress um, and so many more. He received the Right Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize in Stockholm. And he was also named the Outstanding Public Scholar by the International Studies Association in San Francisco. Walden has been a human rights activist since the Marcos era. He's currently active in opposing the anti-human rights policies of the administration of now President Rodrigo Duarte. Walden, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, uh, Marina. Okay. and. Um... Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this conversation uh, with the uh, members of the faculty of the University of Rojava, and also to be with uh, David Harvey, Arturo Escobar, Teresa O'Keefe, and uh, Leopoldo Peco. And uh, thanks, Marina and Mary, for making this possible. I know that we are running out of time, but. Uh, I um, first of all, just just you know what what is so striking about what's happening in Rojava for me is a revolution in education taking place within a larger political revolution taking place in conditions of warfare, and uh, that's you know that's uh, that's uh, an extremely challenging set of circumstances that. Um, not many of us face, but which our comrades in Rojava are uh, in fact uh, taking on. Um, I, I, I think I will just um, uh, uh, ask the question uh, of 
what has been mentioned a number of times, the perspective of genealogy uh, and how this uh, sort of expresses itself concretely in the in in the system of of education in in Rojava, uh, I'd like more clarification on that, if if possible. The second thing is how is the uh, educational approach um, related concretely to the political struggle uh, that is that is now um, you know taking place related to that too is um, uh, what in what are the very concrete ways you know that we on the outside I mean uh, not in Rojado, I mean, I'm speaking from Bangkok and elsewhere uh, um, how can we uh, concretely assist um, in this process that's going on? I know that there has been an invitation, at least an invitation reached me for to become part of a mission to come over there. I, I think early in, in, in next year. And I, I think that would be a very exciting sort of prospect. Uh, and finally, um, what do our comrades in Rojava feel? They, you know, they are especially, you know, what are the key things that they feel they are contributing to this larger educational revolution that's taking place? So those are sort of just interconnected questions. And, uh, you know, thank you again for allowing me to be part of this great discussion. Wonderful. Sadar, do you want to, tr to facilitate the Kurdish pride? Thank you. Yes, sure. Um, okay, I'm going to change between uh, Kurdish and English. Uh, let me first uh, say it in Kurdish. I will know and has to say Perseki Sarakabuj boy Mahabatin Pesha genealogy, Berki Avalzuzan was so good, Kat and Bersva Viabden, Nizan Avalzuzan to Persamugert and Nosa. Tamam, Perseki then have all said, Oh, Siasatin, have Pistivani, Siasatin Solidarity, O Perseki. چند پرسپون درباره برنامه پرورده نزان گهین روزها و او و شوازی که کنکریت کیجان خبرت پیشتی که ون کو امت کارن بالی لسر بکشینن او چه و ام یعنی کسی ندارد ود کارن عالی کار بن یعنی بگشتی او بند زده وقتی مزینه ما از باورم تنه ده پازه دخمه مایه I think we have only 10, 15 minutes, right, Marina? I'm just corresponding with the translators and our wonderful Kurdish translators will go until two o'clock if our friends, and I'm checking in with Romina in Spanish. Um, and if the translators are willing, which is amazing, she is also so much solidarity. Mm -hmm. Okay, then if everyone in Rojava is good, we can go until two o'clock. Yeah. Thank you. Uh... Namaz ozan tu khazi tu dress pe apka? Bersa va genealogy. Hane ki berdavam be bashtir va chun majar berdavam. Eri hata saad du berdavam be. Wal Mustafa tuji ev aliye tekeliyan agar kun hane ki bashtir. Azaj David ha. Berhavale mai majar in takhasu jida baqadi nazaj David hane chan khal hane azaj David ha beshe. Tamam. Ma Mustafa han tuji ege darbari berdavam ya perverde hane ki mina kin تایباد نشان بده که چه برنامه ما لیفی در جدای برنامه دولتی و شوازی که آلترناتی هم دخوازن چه هم کن و که میناک به سیستم ها پرگل اکریدی و آنه ده یعنی برنامه این درسی و آلی هفکاری دیگه زانگه و جیهندن ده باشد به اجی دایبی ده هینه کشتا بجیم آل سوزان دخوازی چه دست بکه 
Yani bu pırsa hani genealogy na pergala perverde de çevaci ihtigres. The question uh, the question about genealogy and how it's integrated into the system of education. Genealogy is a is a part it's a faculty that is linked to sociology in our universities. Uh, our students uh, also in the uh, female uh, educational organizations are studying it as part of so sociology. We are uh, we are using all the experience that are collected from feminists around the world, uh, also from Kurdistan. We're implementing those to give uh, encompassing uh, summary on the progresses of society in relation to the women's struggle. Uh, very early, we um, thought very important to uh, break the the standard of uh, of uh, gender uh, gender. The link between the gender and the state, how it's being enforced in society, it was very important that we are breaking it uh, early. Uh, on the other hand, on the side of economy, also education, uh, defense also, education of uh, military force, we applied the genealogy to it to educate people on how to behave in society. We we are giving the same education also to the co-chairs of all different organizations, also to the uh, family uh, uh, officials that are doing all those works. Genealogy is not only not just not just limited to uh, one subject, but it is seen as an all-encompassing subject of morality that needs to be applied in all different fields of education. We are able by that to analyze uh, all the mistakes that are happening in society by the question of morality, social morality. Uh, the other question, which was pretty long, I will try to reply it. The capitalist system uh, is trying to protect itself and continue itself. What we did uh, is to never separate the question of genealogy from uh, systemic questions as well. We regard every progress in society as a revolution of the woman. Uh, in daily life, for example, we are looking at how the impact of capitalism uh, is getting less when these principles of genealogy are being applied to uh, free society by free the individual woman based on those principles that we are dis discussing. So it's about the freedom of the individual as well that is having kind of like an impact on the, uh, on the uh, lessening strengths of capitalism. It is, it is that way that we are uh, working against the system of oppression that is so intricate uh, woven into society. There are questions were made about how we can be helped uh, in Rojava, North and East Syria. We are seeing that that we we have a huge potential to be able to uh, support also communities from all around the world in a moral way and also ideological intellectual way about how to um, work against the bad influences of capitalism and for that there needs to be uh, progress in the communication to be able to create a more uh, aware uh, situation among all women and societies in general in the world that are trying to uh, resist against the bad effects of capitalism. The things that have evolved in Rosh Ava uh, need to be regarded as your own uh, as your own gain. It is not only regional, it is your own gain. It is values that you want to achieve in your own society that have been achieved in that region. So identifying yourself with the revolution that is being done with the education that is being done. This is already the first step, a most important step to be able to uh, support it uh, in any manner possible. 
And by that also we will be able to stop the invasion by the Turkish state and all the violence that is going on. That's what we believe in. Uh, I'm greeting everybody here that has uh, joined this uh, topic. Uh, we are. I'm greeting every uh, of our guests that is uh, here and ready to to do this talk. Marina gave a lot of effort to be able to organize this very precious meetings with so many important guests. Uh, the international relation of the Rojava universities is indeed uh, quite strong, like with uh, universities in America. We have a couple of um, agreements and contacts with uh, professors from the uh, university in Washington, Connecticut, from the uh, faculty of sociology. We are working together and it's working very well. Um, sometimes there are political situations that are not allowing our work to progress very much, but it's going well. In Connecticut, we have projects that are working together. We have made some projects with uh, the sociology part in uh, Rochava University, so we are thanking uh, them for that opportunity and support. We have also contact with uh, other uh, universities in other countries, like in Germany, uh, they are all official. We have also delegation in Germany for educational uh, purposes uh, for genealogy education. It's working very well. And we have also contracts with um, universities of Parma in uh, Italy. Uh, we are very active and very uh, strongly interacting also in uh, California, also in Iraq, and all other countries. It's working very well. I want to, uh, to let it know that it's going well. But the um, the obstructions that are being given are, of course, a little bit, uh, that are quite uh, debilitating. For example, we had cre struck a deal with uh, universities outside, but uh, on political side, they was uh, intervening and saying that uh, this should be stopped. And, uh, Dr. Marina uh, supported us uh, in this case. We are very grateful for every support. But as you see, there are political uh, actors that are trying to prevent our uh, interactions. Uh, the region of North and East Syria, we are very often calling it a Kurdish region, but it's in fact, it's not the case uh, like that. It is literally and absolutely very true, a multi-ethnic place where in an unprecedented way, so many different ethnicities are applying their educational system for their own culture and for a communal uh, together living in a peaceful way. Uh, and as we said before, uh, society by the freedom of women. And especially the Turkish state doesn't want that uh, revolution based on freedom of women uh, shouldn't succeed, according to them. That's why the Turkish state is attacking Rojava so extremely, uh, savagely. Uh, our friends uh, outside of Rojava and Syria need to be aware that there is a, a war waged on on the education system and uh, there needs to be an active approach and uh, support and solidarity and practice uh, to be able to raise awareness and uh, have a good impact on the on the peaceful options and situation because otherwise it will not quite work out um, there are many many very uh, influential people around the world that if they're talking publicly about what is happening, they would be able to impact um, societies all around the world about how they see the um, the conflict that is happening, namely as an attack, uh, as a one-sided attack of the Turkish state against uh, democratic organizations and universities that try to build a very democratic and uh, peaceful uh, situation. And 
with that kind of support is, uh, that is active, uh, things will be able to change. Uh, otherwise, it is uh, limited to uh, to. Otherwise, it's limited to just symbolical help. So, <laughs> do you want to also talk about something? I want to understand first. Uh, I think there was a question about how you can uh, involve people, people in very difficult situations in this kind of revolution. I want to talk a little bit about the communal system and how you can organize society by that. I think that was one of the questions. I want to re reply it now. Okay, I'll do it now. Uh, some of the teachers, professors have asked about that, how you can mobilize society in Rushab or uh, generally in the world uh, among, amid the difficult uh, systemic situations. So how do you mobilize people? Uh, there are many difficulties that people are living. This is a very, uh, very clear fact. Um, there are so many attacks and obstructions uh, that have been laid in front of us, uh, but still uh, there is uh, a lot of support by the local population for this educational system. Uh, the way we are doing it is by creating communal systems in every region that are governing themselves and interacting very conscious with each other to be able to uh, live together to uh, care, take care of livelihood. Um, these are uh, encompassing all different ethnicities. It's based on local uh, governance, uh, communal uh, uh, councils. We have that. Uh, we have those in all different cities, uh, mixed with all different ethnicities. It is based on the principle of uh, how to be able to overcome the systemic difficulties, uh, to be able to concentrate on uh, on a new solution for the future. Uh, it is uh, a union, a, a union or, uh, in economical way as well. People are helping each other economically, uh, morally as well. They are talking with each other in every region where they are, talking about the experiences and problems that have existed and are showing care to each other to be able to uh, work together in first place. Uh, what, what the people will understand then through these kind of like changes where you're independently trying to organize yourself, you're understanding that you have a part in society, you have a part in changing, changing the system because it's your life that is at stake here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There was a question about about our uh, education system, how it's uh, built up. As the University of uh, Northern East Syria, we are at the stage of uh, of building ourselves up. We are starting with that. We are we are uh, applying also the experiences from the um, Arab uh, colleagues and the universities that had been created before. How did they put the jobs and the structural system? We are still in the process of um, shaping every subject in, uh, in the way 
that we are doing it here, but we want it in every other university as well. Uh, up until now, all the universities had been very theoretical before in the Syrian system, and they were not really relatable to people. Many information, a lot of information was given, but they were not really creating an understanding or social uh, social awareness among students. They weren't really caring about what they were learning before. So we don't want to limit it to theory. We want to um, create our system educational in a very in a very interactive way where there is no difference between student and teacher uh, and each profession is seen as uh, a personal gain by um, letting the students know and feel that it's important what they learn and how they learn that their opinion is appreciated we have difficulties in establishing the special uh, of places, offices like laboratories, uh, because of the uh, embargo and uh, obstructions by states all around. But in a practical way, we are giving our best to give a very practical experience to all the students. Also, during the summer courses, we are offering internships to every person. Uh, student who's uh, who wants to apply their knowledge that they learned to the practice uh, to have immediately an idea of what it means to do these studies. Uh, what we are doing is at the end of the uh, year, we are also uh, offering a test that they have to do. They do not need to just memorize uh, at the end and uh, write it down and then forget afterwards. Our goal is to change that uh, vicious circle. We are engaging every student into the very detail and core of the meaning of education and what it means, what they have achieved. And we are encouraging everybody to do their own research, to talk about it, to feel uh, what they have learned and to be able to identify with it, be proud with it. The teacher is like is like a, a guide, a guide to the students to show them the way of how to be themselves a teacher. They're interacting without having dif uh, differences in their own status. If the student knows something, the student will teach the teacher. Uh, this is the kind of system that we are um, uh, that we are supporting and actually applying. A very practical oriented project where every student is able to apply and be very proud, proud and outspoken about what they have learned uh, in society and be known by that. Uh, and also, I also want to add that uh, some of the questions uh, that were asked, especially those about solidarity. Uh, I mean, as a Kurdish person, uh, we, have been through, uh, we have been through a lot of uh, uh, a lot of terrible things in the past uh, 50 years. Uh, you can go even uh, back to the beginning of the 20th century and the rise of nation states in the region, but especially with the rise of solidarity, international solidarity uh, politics uh, in in the last two decades, I, I might say, uh, Many among the Kurdish communities, many among the people in the region uh, uh, found themselves trying to shop for solidarity, trying to shop for attention. Uh, and this, this has been very damaging. And especially when you look at the region and the, uh, the, the war, the, the occupation uh, war in uh, Palestine and what's happening right now, it's really hard for us to uh, to raise our hands to uh, also demand the part of the attention that have been given to this issue uh, and diverted to the Kurdish question. And this is not ethically a right thing to do as well. I mean, uh, when you go on social media, you see that uh, many Kurdish commentators say they are furious and rightfully so that uh, 
just a few days before the, the new uh, uh, conflict started in, in, in the in occupied Palestine in Israel, uh, Turkey uh, destroyed um, most of the uh, infrastructures in Rojava, killed uh, uh, close to 150 people, including children. And uh, they asked why there wasn't an outcry about that. And similarly with Afghanistan, we see uh, that a lot is happening and uh, a lot of uh, Afghan friends, comrades, they're complaining why, uh, why there is no attention to what's happening there to women, to the people who are struggling, to the radical movements and that part in Iran as well. Many in Turkey are struggling against the dictator Erdogan and they are not getting this attention. I mean, uh, it is... It shouldn't be like uh, the way that this oppressed people, the people very unprivileged uh, in terms of access to uh, to networks, to people, to uh, resources, to demand this attention, to man demand solidarity. We see that solidarity politics in the US, in North America especially, is very much affected by anti-imperialism, which is totally fine, but uh, this anti-imperialism does not uh, address the uh, the sub imperial imperialist wars that are happening, like let's say in the Middle East, how Turkey has been waging war against Armenians, against Kurds, uh, in different parts of uh, uh, not just Middle East but also North Africa, in in uh, against uh, Armenia through uh, Azerbaijani forces and inside against its own people. Uh, and Iran, uh, again, when we look at that in terms of anti-imperialism, uh, I have seen many people that are kind of defending Iran and calling out a, a movement, the Jinjian Azadi movement, something that is uh, related to American politics in the, uh, in the world. I mean, sometimes <laughs> there is an overlap, like when you fight against ISIS and you need the uh, I mean, nation, this, this fight is not just for the Kurdish people, not for Yazidi people. It's on behalf of everyone uh, affected by this war. And when you work with the coalition forces to uh, to destroy ISIS, uh, to eliminate uh, its threat uh, against your communities, it's not collaboration. And the, the uh, people in Rojava, in northeast Syria, they have been saying it's a uh, uh, quite loud that this uh, collaboration does not mean that we approve or we are part of this imperialist project in the region, but we have a very hard time to convince people <laughs> that uh, uh, the attention that you should give this to this region is beyond all of that. The alternative system that has been created in the, in northeast Syria, despite all of the challenges, can be. Uh, can be the future if we support it. It is uh, it is the only hope. I, I say that and I believe in that. Uh, it is the only hope if you want to have a progressive democratic uh, solution for, uh, for everything that's happening in the region. And of course, this solution has many enemies and the the, the solidarity that we can build is so crucial for that. Uh, and the, uh, the work that we are doing, this very meeting uh, it could be part of that. And we cannot emphasize that enough. It's really, really important. And we shouldn't come to scholars, to activists, to uh, communities of resistance uh, to, to give us attention, to, to come in solidarity with us. Uh, and this is what is so great about the uh, work that Mariana and uh, everyone at the sociology department of Bin Compton uh, have been doing because they started this initiative. And we also, as the Kurdish community, as the, all the people of Northeast Syria, as this project, this political progressive democratic project, we don't want to remain in these boundaries. We don't want to be provincialized. As what the uh, people in northeast Syria are saying that this this system, this alternative, is not for only for Kurdistan. This is an, a paradigm for Syria. This is a paradigm 
to solve problems in the Middle East region. And uh, like how Jinjian Azadi became a global slogan, Women, Life, Freedom. This can be part of uh, our global quest to find an alternative for all of these troubles that we are facing. And mm, we are facing an existential threat with all of that. And uh, unfortunately, what's happening in Israel, Palestine in near future can uh, get everyone and uh, it might be too late to do something. So from now on, we can we can build uh, the, the very work that we are doing here. We can build this solidarity, uh, caucuses, uh, little groups, collectives, uh, please be in touch with uh, with folks in Rojava, in anywhere. Communities of resistance are happening around the world. So we are also trying to connect with them. We are connected to uh, many different groups uh, in Southeast uh, Asia, in Latin America. Uh, we, we have been uh, in direct communication with Chiapas, with Zapatistas with many uh, different progressive and leftist parties in Europe, in North America. And this works as really vital for all of us, not just for the people of Northeast Syria. Thank you so much again, and uh, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for such an uplifting in the context of everything, which is exactly what Rojava is doing, right? Kind of then bringing us to the achievements and the possibility, which is incredible right now. Thank you. Um, and thank you for all of that. And Mary, if you'd like to say something, just everyone who came from around the globe, from Asia and Africa and Latin America, um, we have a truly global, the Middle East, a truly global space here, parts of Europe, the United States, all occupied lands. Um, thank everyone. And we will continue. Mary, you? Just to add to the thanks, um, I want to thank everyone who's here, especially the folks from the University of Rojava. And I also want to give special thanks to Marina, who did a lot of work to make this happen, talking to a lot of different people, reaching out to them, making a poster for the first time, I think. And um, I, I thank you all. And I, I look forward to seeing you all again and continuing our work of solidarity. Thank you, everybody.